Well, um, next on the agenda, we have uh, an author and a lecturer, a professor that's joining us to talk about this very specific issue. Um, Dr. Rana Limbo will be joining us for the next hour. Um, she's the Associate Director and Senior Faculty Consultant at Resolve Through Sharing and the Gunderson Health System in Wisconsin. She's trained with, along with her colleagues over 35,000 healthcare professionals, that's amazing, and developed over 100 um, support brochures, training materials, et cetera, uh, to help close that gap that Kylie talked about not having informed providers. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing uh, and certified perinatal uh, loss care. She's also the president of Pregnancy Loss and Infant uh, Death, the Alliance, and she's published many articles, book chapters, position statements, etc. And many of you know about her, uh, may know about her book, uh, her first book, When a Baby Dies, A Handbook for Healing and Helping. We are, which is for sale, uh, by the way, uh, out in the lobby. We are just so thrilled um, to have you with us today, uh, Rana. And you can go ahead and come on up. Thank you. When I speak, I bring articles and resources and everything with me. So to get myself set up, it takes a few minutes. <laughs> but I do that so that in case I want to refer to something that you, that I think you'd want to know about, I have it right here. So I'm very honored to be here today. I have, um, I have prepared this talk in conjunction with Dr. Deb Rich, who is an expert in in mental health and in perinatal loss. She's been an, a Resolve Through Sharing National Faculty member for a number of years. I trained her first in 1989, I think, and uh, we've remained colleagues and friends over the years. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Deb and also you will have, by the way, all of these, I think that someone said that, all of these handouts are online so you can go there and look at this more so you don't have to take notes but she has, um, her daughter was stillborn, her name was Shoshana, and she has honored her and recognized her by developing the Shoshana Center. And uh, she offers a number of services. One of them is a very excellent training for psychotherapists around perinatal loss and perinatal mental health. So the objectives for today are pretty straightforward and I think you'll find them to be um, easy to respond to if anyone should ask. I'm going to talk about the annual statistics. If you don't know them already, you will be surprised, I believe, at how frequent this is and how many um, sisters and brothers there are in, in that group of people who have experienced this tragic loss. And uh, we'll talk about two potential effects of perinatal bereavement associated with maternal mental health and that I'll just tell you now that the most common responses are Kylie addressed it so well, PTSD, anxiety, and depression. And that's what's been studied the most. And then my area of expertise is hospital bereavement programs. That's what I've been doing since 1981. I took a break and got a PhD and all of those things, but this is a field and a, and a, a service and something in my heart that isn't something that I do for a while and leave. It's always been there and it always will be. And so I'm very grateful to be here today and talk with you because I know that this is a group of people who are, commu some are community-based, some are hospital-based, some are psychotherapists. And so there's a wide range of, of folks in the audience. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that I hit on what it is that you would like to know about this topic. And if I don't, I'm staying today and I'm coming back tomorrow. So I would be happy to talk with you and I'll be at the reception as well. I don't have any conflict of interests. Kelly asked me if I would just say a few words about Resolve Through Sharing because I think most of you in the room don't know the program. It began at 
Gunderson Health System, which at that time was called La Crosse Lutheran Hospital and Gunderson Clinic in 1981. And I've always felt that in terms of my life, this is the time when I was in the right place at the right time. I had known when I had gotten a master's degree right after college that I absolutely loved that. And by loved, I mean felt like I belonged in that area between psych mental health and maternal child. And so that leads you to perinatal mental health and it certainly leads you to bereavement. So they were starting this program and someone on the planning committee knew that this was an interest of mine and said, would you consider being the first coordinator? And I, th I think, I I'm not positive about this, I don't have data that's for sure, but I think I was the first hospital coordinator, bereavement coordinator ever. Prior to that time, here's what was happening in the field, parent support groups, Share probably being the most famous at that point. Uh, Miss Foundation certainly is also, and that's, I know, very strong in this area. And um, so we were familiar with that. Then we were familiar with people who were writing about teams. And what they meant by that was in an, an interdisciplinary team, let's say it, but most likely physician, nurse, chaplain, social worker. And those people would be called if someone had a death. A, a, when a baby died and then they would respond to the family in that way so what uh, the people who founded resolve through sharing thought was that this needs to be a one-to-one -one relational experience with someone who's had education in this field knows what to do and how to do it and isn't afraid of it because it can be scary other people's grief can scare us now we have the perinatal program. At that time, it was four days long, three days of, of perinatal content and one day of coordinator training, the train the trainer course, which we began in 85. More recently, we've developed neonatal pediatrics, which is probably going to end up being the course that is taken the most, and then pediatrics and adult. We have all of the experience from these courses from Gunderson. So we use that as kind of the model and then we extend it out through our coordinators really all over the world. On the front page, <coughs> excuse me, home page of our website, that's listed in the resources. There's a slide on resources. When you go online and look at it, you can print it off if you'd like to. But you can get there pretty easily by just typing in www resolve through sharing one word dot org but it's a it's a paper on investing in resolve through sharing creates a culture of compassion enhances quality improves patient and staff experience and supports national standard benchmarks those are the things that we're looking as, at, at as quality markers for our program this is um, a map showing the reach um, we it, it, you know, it's kind of interesting how I think, Kylie, you would probably agree with this, how one situation becomes unbelievably um, more than what you ever dreamed of. And, you know, when Norbert was born, you said you were kind of out of it for a long time. And then now you've sent 6,000 checklists to hospitals in the United States and probably all over the world. And I would say that that's kind of what this was like. Nobody designed this to be spread around. We designed it because we thought that our families needed better care and a more consistent, seamless way of delivering care. And that's how it all began. And then a couple of us talked at an AWAN conference about it. Again, just, you know, sharing some information. And I'm not kidding you, I've never had that pe many people come up, but somebody wanted to buy our slides. And we went back to our institution and said, you know, we can sell our slides, but unless they have the training, the educational component of this, it isn't going to work. Or it'll work for a little while, but not for long enough. So they encouraged us to write a manual, and that's kind of how we got started, because it is a standardized training. They're, they're the same, as close to the same as possible. So our reach has extended, and we're very happy about that, because we feel that we have design something that works internationally and is certainly in the best interest of those that we care for. So I'm going to talk a little bit about evidence-based interventions in perinatal bereavement. 
that's kind of the heart of the talk. And I think you'll all agree with this, that best practice in perinatal health means best practice in perinatal loss and best practice in perinatal mental health. And that's what you are, that's what you've done with this conference today. I tried to put it in this kind of, of diagrammatic, I guess, form, graphic form, so that it makes sense why you as a, an organization have chosen to go in this direction for this conference and why it's so critically important. I wanted to just very briefly say that in the olden days, and I'm talking about late 80s and early 90s, there were people writing about checklists, and it wasn't favorable. Now, we've used a checklist, and by we, I mean resolve through sharing, since the inception. But at that time, it was simply a clinical strategy for keeping track of what had been done so that mothers and fathers weren't asked over and over again, do you want this? Have you seen this? Did you get your discharge instructions? We have a way of keeping track. Now it's in electronic health records. It used to be paper form. Some people still like paper, but... Most, most people who have electronic records are going to that. But we do use a checklist. It is simply a tool. It's not the way that we care for people. But now Harvard has told us checklists, safety, quality, teamwork, seamlessness, it's critical. So um, that is one of the evidence-based strategies that help promote care that is uh, safe and emotionally sound to parents when their babies, baby dies. This is the slide that may surprise some of you. I know some of you in the room already know this, but this is the incidence of perinatal loss in our country every year. 10 to 25% of con confirmed pregnancies end in miscarriage. Isn't that, think about that. That's a lot of heartache. 64,000 ectopic pregnancies, 6,000 that are molar, and 20, about 26,000 stillbirths 19,000 newborn deaths, that's within the first month of life, and 5,100 that die from some problem that is life-threatening that becomes life-limiting. So again, getting back to um, objective three and what are we, what are we going to talk about today that is, is the sort of the essence of a standard that supports maternal mental health, I hope paternal mental health as well. There's nothing more important than relationship-based care and staff education. And um, Kylie's story is one. There are many others. If you're a psychotherapist, you probably have some additional stories of people who have not gotten this. And that's why we said in the very early days of what we were doing that unless we create a sound education model, nothing will work right. And so that is what we have continued to do in Resolve Through Sharing is every couple of years we keep um, updating and bringing in new evidence, but always keeping it relationship-based, that the focus is on you and, and the person that is in that bed or on that table or in that chair. And that one of the things about that that I've come to, um, I don't know, maybe appreciate or feel so strongly about is that there's a Dr. Seuss quote that moments become memories. And I've, there's a book that I have co-authored called Meaningful Moments, Ritual and Reflection When a Child Dies. I've got a few copies along and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But that book is kind of about that. It's about moments that become memories. And so when something happens in the room or in the hallway, when your baby has died or you know your baby's going to die and it hurts you, that is a moment that becomes a memory and it is very, very difficult to ever erase it. So what we say as we teach is everything matters, but it shouldn't keep you from engaging because people understand authentic caring Sometimes someone will say, I felt like I foot, put my foot in my mouth, and I said, what kind of relationship did you have with that person? 
well, really good. She thanked me over and over, and they've come back, and they've asked for me. And I've said, well, then you didn't really put your foot in your mouth. You did something in that relationship that you regret, but it didn't end the relationship, nor did it become a bad memory. It was taken in the context with which you meant it, which was an attitude of caring and concern, and it came out wrong. <laughs> so. The other part of a standard of care is the idea of inter interprofessional. We really believe in that, and I hope that those of you who are, say, psychotherapists and you're working with, with people who have experienced any, whatever kind of care, but they're coming to you for some sort of complication of their grief, that they can talk to you about that they, a chaplain stopped or their, um, their um, rabbi came to see them or that they had a physician who knew how to deliver bad news. And that, by the way, there's really great evidence. I'll just share this with you. There's a, there's a way to deliver bad news, and there's certainly a way not to. One woman that I knew a long time ago s said that her physician said to her after her stillbirth, I told you you shouldn't have smoked. I know. You, you, you think, really? That came out of somebody's mouth. But... Um, the, the idea about delivering bad news is that you, you fire a warning shot. Some, some um, resources talk about it that way, but you let people know. And one way of doing that is to say, I wish I had something different to tell you. And so it puts people in that frame of mind that something that they're not going to want to hear is coming. And it, so it's, it's a way of preparing, taking a deep breath, and then going on and saying, I'm so sorry to tell you that I don't see your baby's heart beating on the ultrasound. Here's where it should be beating, and you can see with me that it's not beating. And it's, it's the worst moment of anyone's life. And so the physician, the midwife, they don't have to go on and on. They do not have to go on and on, but they need to be compassionate in their delivery of the news. So family is, dis is central to decision making. I think that as an organization that is very concerned about family-centered and person-centered care, you understand that, that um, people like to know, what are, what are your thoughts on this? And I'm going to talk to you a little later about hope and how hope can help so much with d assessing decision making. Keepsakes, I'm going to show you a few but photography is one idea. There are many other things that you can do. And then we also believe, and the evidence would show, that follow-up is important. I got, I got, it's an interesting email that I got from one of our trained people at a very major children's hospital in the United States, and she said they've stopped doing follow-up. And she said that the reason that they stopped was that um, they felt that it was not advantageous to express their condolences, like through the first year. And I, I, I wrote back and I said, where did you get the idea that follow-up is expressing condolences? I mean, it's part of it, yes, but follow-up care from a hospital perspective, and you can make it what you want where, where you are if you have groups or if you, if you are a home visitor and go into the home, Follow-up is, how are things with you? And you mean that, like from a very broad perspective. It's a way to monitor. Um, what Kylie was saying, if I were doing follow-up, I would have a very strong sense, if um, I talked to her even on the phone or shared an email, of what was happening. And that is what follow-up is about, because the person doing follow-up needs to know how to make a referral to those of you psychotherapists in the room who are waiting for patients to come and see you because you know you can help. And so that's what follow-up is. And the, the evidence now says, too, that pregnancy after a loss is a critical time. Lindsay's going to talk about that in a few minutes. And um, so that that's a time to be watching. So, you know, sometimes you'll be doing follow-up. Let's say you do it for a year, and it could be a lot of different things. You might send materials or you might do a phone call. Um, you may um, do email. There are lots of ways to do follow-up. But you might also find that the person's pregnant. I mean, that's, that's not all that, that uncommon. And so then you, your mind is going with what kinds of things might have come up that are now related to this pregnancy. 
I don't think that there's anyone that doesn't share a degree of Kylie's experience with the next pregnancy. It's never the same. That's what everybody says. That carefree, um, isn't it all wonderful feeling never comes back when you've had a baby die because you know what can happen, whether that was early on or later or after birth. So that's why follow-up is important. And I'll show you some photos in a little bit. Kathy Kobler and I wrote an article in this um, journal, the American Journal of Maternal Child Nursing, on relationships. And it was published in 2010. I'd encourage you, if you have access to a library, you may want to look at it because I think it can help whether, no matter what you're doing, home visiting, a nurse at the bedside, um, psychotherapy, others who have other positions here. And I know some of you are administrators and leaders, but I do think that it can be a helpful article because one of the things that we talk about in that is that there are so many relationships. When we talk about relationship-based care, Maybe what comes to mind is the, maybe the mother and the physician, for example. But really, the relationships are very layered. When people are in the hospital, a nurse will say, without a doubt, that he or she has a relationship with the baby, whether the baby's living or whether the baby died. And so that, that is one to respect and nurture and share with the parents, and it can be so simple. We have a video that we show in our perinatal training, and the mother's um, name is Tammy, and her daughter Sarah was stillborn, and Tammy starts to tear up, and she said she can st she'll always see that nurse patting Sarah's butt. <laughs> now, Sarah had died before birth, but the nurse was carrying Sarah around as you would carry any baby and was patting her. That's the moment that becomes a memory. And so it's the things that we have to be very conscious about as we care for people, that there are so many relationships. This is a little baby, Eden, who um, had a life-threatening condition that ended her life at 11 days of age. She had trisomy 18 and, and um, hypoplastic left heart. So she was home with her family, and this shows cousins and siblings holding her. So she was home for 11 days, and she was never put down, and the family is very, very pleased about that. So again, it's those memories of her being in the home. They were really ready to leave the hospital because there wasn't anything that they could do from a treatment standpoint except palliative care and keeping her, keeping Eden comfortable. And that's what they did. So this shows how, how layered those relationships are. This article, this first article that's on this slide, Adelson, um, 2011, is really a great article. She's worked with Dr. Kristen Swanson. Some of you may know her work on caring. She developed a mid-range theory of caring with these five dimensions, maintaining belief, being with, knowing, doing for, and enabling. And uh, Dr. Adelson uses this method of caring for women after miscarriage and they found a substantial reduction in from a first study to a second study that incorporated this intervention <coughs> a substantial decrease in complications emotional complications after miscarriage miscarriage might be i did research on miscarriage in the 1980s with sarah wheeler and we found something that I think all of you um, it, it will help to know. In that particular study, which was longitudinal, which was done at our hospital, which is rural and white for the most part, um, in that study, about 25% of the women who had a miscarriage said that they, they didn't feel like they'd lost a baby and their grief was mild, if at all. Then the 75% was that other group that we tend to think more about, I think, and that is um, perhaps deep grieving for a long time, the loss of a child, the loss of a baby. And our work has been validated now by, I think, three other researchers who have found pretty much the same thing. So what does it tell you? Well, it, it means that if you are entering a room or if you're seeing someone for the first time who had a miscarriage, it might be important to say, how is all of this for you? or something to that effect. We found that by, by um, stepping in carefully, the language that someone used in talking about it, and these were all women, 
could could go very quickly to tearing up, not being able to talk, uh, finding it hard to use the words, and then suddenly the word baby would come out. And anyone who believes that what they lost was a baby, I think you can kind of go without asking too much more that they're they're sad. This was their child. And so um, it's it's so terribly important to be very careful in assessing after a miscarriage that you don't assume one or the other, that you ne do need to check it out. And Swanson's theory of caring is a great way to do that. One of the things I want to tell you is that there are too many slides for one hour, and I knew that. <laughs> so what I decided when I was preparing this was that because you were going to get a a copy of this, you'll have those extra slides, and you'll have all of the references at the end, some of which I didn't even use, but I put in, because I know when I go to a conference, sometimes the thing that I want most is to be able to read a couple of things that tell me more about something, so I've tried to do that for you. Guided participation, what is it? It's a method for teaching and learning. I worked on this with my advisor when I was in my PhD program. We worked with mothers who had extremely preterm babies who lived. And we followed them from the hospital through the, at least the first year at home. And we were looking at feeding and growth. And you'll see a videotape of one of these mothers in, in a little while. But I just wanted to briefly say that guided participation includes a guide and a novice and that the guide is more knowledgeable in a certain area. And I think that that's perfectly okay when you're working with someone in a professional capacity. You may well know, I mean, Kylie said it so well, She's, she needed a guide. What, you know, what do I do? What in the world am I supposed to do right now? And so the guide, the gentle, I like to use that word when we're talking about bereavement because this isn't a, you know, now this and then that, and like from a checklist. It's, it's the guide that listens and learns and engages and then knows how to move someone forward. So that's really what guided participation is. And the clinical application for guided participation was it advanced by the person who was my mentor and advisor in my PhD program, Karen Pridham. And so uh, very briefly, because again, I think you'd, you'll want to read more about guided participation to perhaps understand it more fully. But I think it's a very valuable tool to use whether you're in a private practice, no matter what discipline you are. And on your tables, you each have a handout. There should be one that, um, that's a circle. You see those? Those are for you. Because what's on there is the, similar to what's on here, that we, we define an issue the competencies are from both the professional and the parent, or in, in this case, the parent. And then the processes used are also outlined on the far right. So I'm just going to give you one example of, uh, of a competency and one example of a process so you sort of know how this works. It's not linear. It's not hierarchical. It's much more how this diagram is drawn. So. Perhaps um, I'll just take something that's familiar to me, which is I'm going into a room for the first time to see, I work mother baby in a hospital and I'm a bedside nurse and I'm going into the room for the first time in the morning when I come on to meet a mother and dad who had a stillborn baby the night before. So I have in my head this model I don't know what the issues are. I can guess because I've worked with a lot of families, but each person is individual. So what do I do first? I'm going to be thinking about that process of getting and staying connected. And how does one do that? You introduce yourself. You call yourself by name. You let someone know what, what, you've, what you are, what you'll be doing with them. You might say something like, is there anything I can get for you right now? And then you may leave. And then you're back again in a few minutes doing something else. This, relationships like this tend to develop over time. And time, by time, I mean in a day. <laughs> you know, it used to be that women stayed three and four days. That's not true anymore. But you can use the process of getting and staying connected. I'll tell you a very brief story of a family that I cared for. Same, same scenario. Mother, baby, Saturday evening, 
I was a bedside nurse. Their baby had died. Um, the burial service actually had been that day, but mother, the mother had complications, so she was still in the hospital. And so um, I felt, you know, anxiety in my chest before I even went into the room. And I walked in, and the first thing I saw, and I still have a slide of this because it was so such a memory for me, on the bulletin board was a six-year-old's note to her Uncle Tom and Aunt Tony, and it said, I am so sorry that your baby Lacey died. And then she had X's and O's out. I've never forgotten it because that is what everybody needs to know how to say and how did Kathy know when she was six but she did so that's what I saw so then I you know was able to come in and and ask about Kathy and see how they were doing but I was in and out she wasn't my only patient that night I was in and out throughout that shift and it was it was the most amazing experience we've reconnected now we both work at Gunderson we reconnected at an anniversary brunch of about 10 years ago and um, they haven't forgotten either. They wanted to talk about their relationship, how it got started, what it was like, how they met, you know, all of those kinds of things. We hardly talked about the baby. And they were so engaged in telling me about their relationship. So that's what I mean when un under competencies about being with and knowing others. It isn't, it isn't what's on your agenda, it's, it's what's on theirs. And it, you, it may surprise you sometimes what people really want to talk to you about. But I knew that they were sharing things with me because they felt that they could. And we had a wonderful evening. And uh, in spite of the fact this was the worst day of their lives. And in many years later, um, when she heard my name, she said, I don't know if you remember me or not. I said, I will never forget you. <laughs> so there is the um, handout that you have. The, the processes are in, on the right, the issues on top, and then guided participation goes around caregiving, which is what we call the care that families give to their children, whether the children are living or dead. We've talked about that, I've talked about that. Um, being sure, this was a um, research award winning poster at the A1 meeting in 2014. And I, I wanted to point out that one of the findings from a study that I did recently on miscarriage was the idea of being sure. And nearly everyone in that study, no matter how they felt about the miscarriage, needed to be sure before they made any decision at all to intervene. So intervention is typically surgical, medical, which is inserting a tablet into the vagina, or watching and waiting and seeing what happens. And sometimes those, those women decide to do a DNC and other times they just wait for the miscarriage to happen. But the idea of being sure probably applies to most any decision making. We haven't really studied it, but I wanted to let you know because um, I, I was telling this to, I was talking about this research to one of the people that I work with, an office assistant that I've known since I was in, at Gunderson before. And I said, well, this is, you know, you had a miscarriage. What, does this sound familiar? She said, familiar? I was lying on the table and they were getting ready to do the DNC and I kept saying, are you totally sure that this baby died? And so it's a very important question and intervention should come after the certainty. Relational learning, um, nurses have the highest anxiety about caring for the dying or the bereaved, and knowing that, it means that our, our educational process is pretty important. And it should include skill building and empathy parallel process. Um, in, the, in the citation that says Limbo 2013, that's a free downloadable position paper that I've written on education, but I talk about that the relationship among the, the people who are in the room and between the, that group and the faculty and between the faculty themselves are all ways for parallel process to work. You can see caring, guidance, and all of the processes that are part of guided participation. The importance of being and then continuing education that's consistent with the organization's mission and strategic plan. More and more, that's what people are asking before you do education is how does it fit with our mission? These are a number of photos that, um, see if I can, this is baby Annie, 
And this is a little bear that had Annie's heartbeat in it. <laughs> Can you see? Let's see, it's over, over there. So it's a family who pushed the little bear around while the mom was pregnant with Annie, who was born and died. And so the children were very much into this whole thing about having the bear. And you can see in that middle picture, that's a very tiny baby. You can see that very easily with the comparison with adult hands. And so it doesn't have to be facial, if, um, although I think a picture of the whole baby is very important. And I really love this dad's look. You'll see, I think I've got another picture of the family. This is the same, this is his little girl and then their, their little baby that died. This happens to be baby Lacey that I was just talking about. These are the parents um, of Kanani, and little Kanani is lying there after she's died. And you can see there are certain things about this that are probably important to look at. One is that her coloring is very dark, and that's quite common as oxygen decreases. Her brothers are just not quite sure. They're three in one, not quite sure exactly what they're, they want to do. But um, Kanani and her husband are from Southern California, and they were on a parent panel when we were, were out here um, about a year ago. And um, they've done a lot of things to honor her, but we were very pleased that they were willing to share this photo because it's a very pretty relational photo about the family. She says about this picture that that's one of the happiest moments of her life. Quite something on the day your baby dies. And then I wanted to show you these photos because this is all one family. So remember we talked about layered relationships. And this is the, the, nurse, the nurse midwife and the nurse and mom and dad. The kids are participating in a first bath. There's Eden at home. There's, I think, cousins holding Eden. So those were the things that they got to accomplish. And you can see how many people loved Eden. This part I'm going quickly through because I have more things that I want to talk to you about in terms of um, what I've seen with depression. So themes of miscarriage, uh, turmoil being sure, adjustment and resolution. It can take any, any amount of time for that to happen. So what causes complications and trauma? And those are some of the things that can happen. And of course, sometimes a maternal death happens. And so you're, you're working with a family that is left completely bereft by um, not only, sometimes the baby dies and sometimes the baby lives, but whatever is happening in that family, they've got a lot of um, experiences that they never imagined would happen. We wrote a brochure for um, family members when a mother dies that is on our website and it's downloadable because one of the things that we've realized with this situation is it's often unexpected and everybody that's there is wondering now what do we do so those are the the kinds and the poor patient experience can be anything I worked with a family a while ago and they had a baby die as a newborn and then they had another baby who was in the NICU and they believed that their care, uh, that the NICU staff was judgmental of them, and I, I don't know, um, but that's what they felt, was judgmental of them, and they felt ostracized and like they weren't welcome there, and they still, to this day, say the experience with their baby living was worse than when their baby died because of the relationships. Yep. So these are two population studies that... Um, basically saying increased risk during pregnancy but not after and increased risk of that's perinatal mood, uh, mood and anxiety disorders persists beyond the birth of a healthy baby. So this is a, a clip of a couple, Jill and Jen, whose first baby Jaden died and I put it in here not so much because of uh, that they're sharing things about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders but because of what a moment how a moment matters and how they define family. I think it's so valuable for us because we know that some of these things that can be hurtful, can't get, they can't get rid of them. And you'll hear, this is quite a while after their son died. They've now subsequently had two other children. 
they, by the way, they, they said I, we stopped counting at $100,000 for um, getting their first baby. You know, it was so costly. And um, they, they had really great social support. And I think that that has been something that's really saved them. This is Marie Walter, the lead educator for uh, Resolve Through Sharing. Are there wise, wise words, words for health care providers, providers that you can provide that, that would, would help, help us get, get to that point of inclusion where we can ask those generic questions rather than where's the father? Um, ways that we can treat people more equally that you could suggest today? Well, I would have to start off by saying that everybody in the healthcare facility in, makes an impact on the patient, including yeah. a facility worker. Is that what it was, a facility yeah. worker? When, when we um, delivered Jaden, um, there was a facility cleaning person that we encountered that made a joke um, that was just so inappropriate during our grieving process. Um, you know, like uh, the labor and delivery floor is closed or the elevator. You can't, you can't go through that door because we were being escorted up to labor and delivery. I mean, she's full of amniotic fluid. I mean, we were Early. losing a baby. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, he needs to make a joke in the hallway on our way up. I mean, that actually made an impact on us mm -hmm. that we will we'll never forget. We remember so it, yeah. It's important yeah. To, to kind of think of that mm -hmm. in the healthcare model of service. Mm -hmm. um, and grief mm -hmm. can be impacted by your patient from any. Mm -hmm. job, any line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those that have the initial patient contact, uh, you know, just to coach and teach inclusiveness. And it doesn't even have to be about same-sex couples. It just has to be about, there are so many different kinds of families and makeup right. of families right. that you can't always assume that this is the makeup of a family. And not to, not to go into it scared, you know, oh, they're two same-sex people. I've never encountered that before. It's a patient. Mm -hmm. And there's two patients or there's five patients and they're bringing in their loved ones. This is the family you're caring for. Mm -hmm. Care for the family. Okay. And also looking at what's anxiety and sort of teasing that out from PTSD, post-traumatic stress, uh, and teasing that out from excessive worry. And other stressful life events can contribute to these sorts of things as well as the death of a baby. And that we have population-specific screening and diagnostic tools now, which are the right ones to use. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but it's one of the questions that probably some of you have dealt with and struggled with is what, what is the right thing to do? There, um, one of the, the article that I mentioned, the Adolfson 2011 article on miscarriage and the caring theory, one of the things that, that she writes about is that they use the perinatal grief scale. And that helped a lot. By the way, um, uh, Mary Ann Huddy didn't develop that scale, but she has another scale that she is getting ready to test for clinical use. And that's, that's the other thing with some of these, these scales. They're used in research, and they've been translated into a lot of different languages, but they're not necessarily good for clinical practice. So that's what we're waiting for, to help us distinguish between um, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and normal grief. So what is a common trajectory of effective interventions? Interception care, it is so important. And that gets back to follow-up because of the fact that between 50 and 80 percent of women will get pregnant again. And so uh, if that happens right away, or if it happens at six months, or it happens at nine months, or it happens in a year, you are still doing some sort of follow-up, and it might be a way of helping people get resources that they need. Using anticipatory guidance, I think that that um, what Kylie said is really, uh, really high underscores that, and that's to plan ahead and to know what people might need to know and not be hesitant to bring it up, to know what's on a checklist but not use it in front of the patient. I know that that is a way that some people do checklists, and it's so distracting, and it makes people feel like they're, you know, like they're in a checkout line. And so it's it's terribly important to know the things so that you can help people anticipate. Psychoeducation, uh, critical for staff. Social support is probably the biggest treatment for depression that there is. And Jill and Jen, that you just met, had a tremendous amount of that. So that really helped them. And then I really believe that the guided approach to teaching and learning is the way to go. This is here only if you're interested in nutrition. There's really no cause and effect research that's been done on that, but this is going to be in the handout that is online, so you can get all of this. You don't need to write it now. But there are some associations with uh, countries where the, the diet is high in omega <coughs> and, 
fatty acids, omega-3 and fatty acids, and, uh, but, but definitely not cause and effect at this point. Feeding support project. I have uh, 15 minutes left and I will be done on time, so I want to make sure that you see some of the videos I have. The feeding support project is what I told you about. I worked on it during my doctoral career, and I was an intervention nurse. And the family that I'm going to show you is one of the families that I was the nurse for. And one of the things, we, we look mostly at feeding and growth, but we also assess depression. And we use video playback. I don't know if any of you have done that in your practice. But um, it is, it's absolutely fantastic. We would videotape a feeding and show it back. And uh, again, we guided. So we didn't say, did you see this, and this, and this. We'd say, what do you see here? We'd stop it, we'd pause it, and say, what do you see here? A mother who had a, a baby, she was uh, very poor, and she was living in one bedroom in her father's apartment with this baby that was very ill. And we videotaped a feeding. The public health nurse and I were making this visit, and the public health nurse actually was caring for her. Videotaped the feeding. She was trying to watch TV and feed her baby. And so um, it was a little room, and we were the ones that were intrusive. We were there with a camera, and it would only fit on this one side of the bed. So she had to turn around to see the TV, and we were there during her favorite soap. So there you go. What would you be doing? I'd want to watch the TV. And so you see her uh, trying to watch TV and feed the baby. And so what's happening, the bottom nipple is down here. You know, and the baby's kind of struggling for it. So the next time we came, um, we had had a chance to look at it. And we stopped the tape there. And we said, you know, Nicole, what's happening right here, right here? And she said, oh, my. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that. And when Karen, Dr. Pritam, made the, the final visit of the study, this young mother said, thing she learned was that her baby needs her and Karen said how did you learn that from that videotape <laughs> so um, it's you know the power of seeing and so anyway this that's why that's why we have videotapes of all of these because it's how we did our work so th this is Ann and Betsy Ann's the mother and Betsy's the baby she was the I think B Betsy was the youngest baby in the study she was born at exactly 23 weeks her mom would say she was not. She was born at about 22 weeks and, and four days, but they wouldn't have resuscitated her if um, they had known that. And so um, this is just one. I have, I have these graphs done because when I talk about this in length, I want people to see what someone with a baby who lives might be grieving as well. And this is just one little part. Look at the feeding from September to February, all breastfeeding, then pumping till, till letdown, because Betsy wasn't growing. And so we worked with a lactation consultant to figure out how to help her. And so is it any wonder that at the four months adjusted age video that mom looks like this? And Betsy is seated upright. That always bothers people with this because she had severe reflux which is the stomach contents coming up in the esophagus. So she had to sit that way. She's very fussy and squirmy. And mom is talking to two other children. She had three children, four and under, and Betsy is on oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. And she only met the kids. She only met the kids? Yeah, but not us. Yeah. Yeah. Calm down. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. I'm not sure that. Don't you know?
give her it right today. I'm going to give it to her tomorrow. That's when it's going to be done. We could glue it. If we had longer, I'd ask you to evaluate that, that set of tapes, but I'll just point out a few things. Anne was, um, I can't remember what she scored on the CESD. Again, this was for research purposes, but definitely in high depressive symptoms in the, at that first feeding. So what did you see there? You know, Betsy's squirming all over, doesn't want to eat. We always said that baby is half of the equation. And so a baby that can't settle and can't take in food, there's nothing that's more gratifying for a mother than for someone to eat, particularly when the baby's having trouble growing. So she's talking to other children. Mom is distracted. She looks just really worn down, and I, I, she really was. It was that visit, I think, when we stood at the curb, and um, she was crying and saying goodbye to me. And I said, Anne, I am not sure that it has to be this difficult. And that was my guided approach to um, onward to suggesting that perhaps an evaluation by a mental health person would be beneficial. And that resulted in um, individual counseling as well as marital therapy. And that had happened between those. I'm not saying that that was solely the, the, the uh, reason, but I think it made a really big difference. But that's how I started it. I wonder, that's a, that's a guided participation word. I wonder if it has to be this hard. And I, because I'd known for a while that she was struggling with depression. So in the second video, it isn't like the, a miracle has happened, but in a way it has, because you see that the little baby Betsy now can look at her mom a little bit, because the, the problem with eye contact is a relational issue. And so you see that she can, and that Anne gets down, and she's talking to her, and that is engaging Betsy in eating. So she's, she took most of that food, but Anne still had some of the same things that she was dealing with, like her other children talking to her, but she was feeling a lot better. So that's what depression can look like and how it can look when it gets treated. So I call these the pearls of hope. Um, that's my name for these, not Futner's, but Chris Futner is a, a physician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he's written a lot about hope, and I think it is one of the strongest concepts we have in this field of perinatal mental health and perinatal bereavement. And so he's, these are his two pearls. Given what you are now up against, what are you hoping for? Do you mind telling me what else you might be hoping for? Exploring hopes is a way of helping people see that there might be a future. Exploring hopes lets people know that hopes change because they can change from one minute to the next, let alone one day to the next. And hope can give people that little bright light they need to keep going. So I suggest that you keep this in your, your little tool bag because assessing where people's hopes are when they are saying that they feel hopeless, and they maybe do, there's probably something they're hoping for, like maybe even to feel better. And that gives you a starting place as a psychotherapist, as a home visitor, as a nurse, as a social worker, a chaplain. It gives you a place to start. So I'm hoping that hoping that, that will be useful to you. Um, I did bring, this is a book that I'm the uh, co-editor of, which was, it's a 2016 publication 
But if you want sort of a general overview that's interprofessionally written and has a lot of perinatal and pediatric bereavement in it, like Dr. Futner, who I just talked about, has a chapter with someone else in this book on, on hope, but they've come up with the term regoaling. And I love that because it means, you know, the hope is dynamic and you can set different goals at different times. But anyway, there's a piece of paper, um, there's a handout on the handout table. Uh, you can order this from Amazon and you can order it from Resolve Through Sharing, probably some other places too, but it's a Springer publication. We looked for people that had a broad understanding of perinatal and pediatric bereavement. So there are things on hope and children and Kathy Kobler and I wrote a, a, a chapter on perinatal and pediatric bereavement that closes the book. Um, anyway, I won't go into that. The, you can look at the online for the, what is in that. And then the importance of ritual in relationship. Um, this is from a book Kathy Kobler and I published in 2013. And one of the things from that book that I think really fits well with what we're talking about now is that ritual flows from relationship. Relationship forms the bridge from suffering to hope. And hope transforms. That's how it all fits together. And um, that key ingredient of relationship is, is the solid centerpiece of this. So what do we mean by ritual? It can be a lot of different things, but ritual, whether for staff, we think it really is important for staff as well, or for families, um, we think that when it grows out of the relationship, if mom and dad or mom and mom say something like, um, I wish we could, you can make a ritual out of that, whatever that is. And it, it tends to be a way of bringing peace and it makes memories that truly can last a lifetime. Anyway, I have, the book is $20 and I, I brought a few copies along um, just in case some of you might want it for someone else or for your practice. My sister's a psychotherapist and she uses this quite a lot. She works a lot with infertility, women who've had infertility. So um, this is a book that she finds helpful when there have been multiple losses and multiple stressors. So in closing, um, I kind of, this has special meaning to me because I met um, Kristen, that's Kristen and her husband, Andy, pregnant with their first baby, Emily. And I met her when she was on a parent panel at Huntington Hospital, so um, out in your neck of the woods. And we kept in touch. And she was such a gracious mother. She, she had taken, I, I swear they had a thousand photos of Emily. She lived about two weeks, not quite. She was, she was deprived of oxygen at birth. And that was her condition. Uh, it has a different name than that, but that's what happened. And so she was alive for quite a while, but not very responsive. And so she died on, um, I think she was born on September, I've got it somewhere. September 21st and died October 4th. And um, so, I met, so I met Emily and we stayed in touch. And the thing about this was that she must have written me three times and asked, where are my photos? And in a nice way, but I hadn't done anything with them. I was waiting, I don't know what I was waiting for, but I needed some sort of inspiration. And so I worked with, I was given a, a recognition um, last spring and it required a lecture. And I thought, this is gonna be Emily's time. <laughs> so I worked with our medical media provider and worked with Kristen, um, excuse me, with, um, yeah, with Kristen to have a voiceover. So you're gonna hear mom's voice. And she came specifically to hear that. So I closed that talk with this and I'm gonna close this talk with, with a story of Emily. And I guess what I really want you to see is when we talk about relationship, how many people had one with this precious little baby that lived only a few weeks. So from the Jareds, here's Emily's story. When, when I, I look, look at the picture of us standing in the driveway, I remember we were just so blissful. We were so happy, and we were very excited. When Andy came in to see me, he said, our little girl's very sick, and they're not sure she's going to live through the night. And I remember coming into the hallway, and there were all these people we knew, and thinking, oh my gosh, it must be really, really bad. But I remember just touching her and thinking, 
is this what all of this was for, for it to be this one time I get to see her? Her nurses were, they were angels. When we came down the morning after, Andrew said, there's a little Noah's art quilt on her, and the nurses made a little gauze bow. I got to hold her for the first time, and June was doing the respirations, and she was so gentle and careful. I just, I have never felt more complete in my life than that moment. And then when, um, when Andy was able to hold her, it broke my heart that this was the only way he was going to be able to be a daddy, was holding her in the hospital. But at the same token, so humbly grateful to all these people standing around that they were doing this so we had this you know we had this memory I just remember never feeling like we were in this alone that they were there with us and the fact that they let us see their tears that meant more than anything that that this touched them we invited and we asked people we loved come and meet her I didn't want her just to be a vague idea for people so it was very important that People saw that this was our daughter. For as little time as we had her, this was our daughter. Emily was removed from life support at 9 in the morning on October 4th. And we picked her up and we whisked her into one of the sleeping rooms. And Taryn was right behind us. And she said, I'm going to stay with you guys and take pictures. And she sat in the back of the room and proceeded to take these beautiful pictures of us holding her and loving her, and what price could you possibly put on that gift that she gave us? She just slowed down and slowed down, and then she quit breathing. So the fact that she was able to die being cradled by both of us, I'll never forget that. I felt like we did the best we could for her and by her, and we had a lot of help and knowing that she had a place in our family and that she'll continue to have a place in our family, that my children talk about her. I mean, we talk about the circle of life. I said, you know, some people have really big circles and there's other people that have really little circles. And it doesn't mean their circle is less important. It's just their circle was done quicker. And your sister had a really little circle, but that circle sure touched a lot of people and I'm really thankful that we were there for it. So perhaps that's a very symbolic way of ending, is with a circle. Because that's really what this work is about. And we're sometimes a part of that, or sometimes we watch it. But um, to hear her say that Emily's was just a little smaller, but she had a circle, is I think a powerful way of symbolically representing the life of someone so very important who wasn't able to be around for very long. These are resources that you can find when you look at the PowerPoint and I will just point one out to you and that's plida.org. There are cards on the table outside uh, about the biennial conference for that group. Kylie is speaking. Um, I'm speaking. Lots of folks that are very interested in this field will be there. It's in Phoenix, September 28th to October 1st. So I'm hoping that maybe this will be an area that you'd like to explore more and you'll hear people from all over the country and the world actually giving some, oh, Lindsay's speaking, sorry, Um, and giving some really excellent, are you as well, Ivy? Sorry. This is what happens when I don't prepare. I'm looking around the room. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's a, it's an international perinatal bereavement conference, the only one of its kind, and we, we meet every other year. So I thank you very much. I'm a little bit over. I'm sorry, but it's time for your break. If you're interested in the book, it's at the where you registered, and it's $20, and um, that's kind of how I'll end things. Dr. Limbo, thank you so much for sharing so much about such an important and powerful and touching subject and 
we should have had Kleenex out for all of you. That that video was was a kicker. And later this afternoon, we're going to be in the same the same boat. We're going to send we somebody out tissues. for tissue. Okay. Um, but I also wanted to provide you a small um, token of our appreciation. This is a book called Tokens of Affection from a friend of the maternal mental health field, Karen Kleiman, um, about reclaiming a marriage after postpartum depression, and perhaps will provide some great insight for you in this important work you're doing. Thank you again. Thank you.